Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Integration Down Under November 2023 meeting. Uh, the, our organizers are Martin, Dan, Mick, Wagner, and myself here in Melbourne. And tonight's speaker is Martin Abbott. Uh, we didn't start the fire, which uh, that's a pretty good one. Um, and if people aren't familiar with fire, it's the Kind of the next iteration of HL7 as best <gasps> I can describe it. <laughs> but it's a healthcare based protocol. So what I'll do is let me just hand over to uh, Martin and I will. Uh, oh, we've Inception. got Inception. Look at that. That's brilliant. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. And I will um, go to just his slides. Do you, is that all right with you? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Okay. Just, yeah. just, just the slides there. Yeah, and I'll, and, I'll swap between slides and and a browser and Postman, right? But, um, but we'll, yeah. I, can, I can do all that for so, my screen. Good. Yep, there we go. And I will go on mute for the time being. So if you need me, I will be listening in. Yeah, and if there's any questions, Bill, just call them out as we go. That's fine. Yep, I've got that um, for people to post post any questions in the. Um, So they should be able to do that without a too bad. Um, yeah, I'll mix or uh, mix there. Um, so um, sorry about that, Mick. But okay, <laughs> I'll hand over to um, Martin and let him go. Okay, right. Thank you, Bill. Um, yeah, so it was a pretty obvious title for me. I'm a Billy Joel fan, so we didn't start the fire. It was pretty, pretty obvious. I was going to have the music playing, but I thought that might be taking things just a little bit too far. Uh, so hello, my name is Martin Abbott. Uh, I used to be an MVP and a regional director in the old days. Then I worked for Microsoft, and, and now I'm no longer working for Microsoft. Uh, so, uh, so I'm no longer an MVP. Uh, Evalisca is my own uh, consulting company, so that's something that I was started. And, uh, for, for reasons that I won't go into. Uh, but yeah, so I've got a long-standing background in, in integration and, and Azure integration services in particular. So I wanted to start with talking about what Fire isn't. So it's not Fire and Emergency Services, right? So so Fire, as you saw, was F-H-I-R, and I'll go into what that, uh, that acronym means. Um, but I, I did think that, uh, you know, the fire service, which is what it is in Azure, is, is a great name and, and a little bit ambiguous. So I thought, it's, yeah, it's definitely not fire services. Um, as Bill alluded to, it's kind of an evolution of, of HL7, right? So HL7, Health Level 7, uh, anybody, and, and we are all uh, integration people here, so uh, anybody knows who's who knows me that I always get the word BizTalk in every presentation. So anybody who's uh, worked with BizTalk in the past with the health, in the health area, healthcare area, we know HL7 from, from the BizTalk side of things and, and the messaging side of things. Uh, it's a standard. It's an open standard that uh, that defines messaging protocols across the healthcare space. Fire is a, an evolution of that. Um, I did wonder if uh, if they were going to be clever enough to say, okay, well, when we create our, our, um, our group of people who look after fire, we should call ourselves the fire brigade. But I don't think they actually did, which is a real shame. Uh, but you can see there that um, essentially that's what defines the, uh, the standard. You can see there's a foundation and a few other bits and pieces. I'm going to show that in, in, a, in a little bit of more detail in a, in a little while, and we'll go through that. So what's the evolution of that? Well, HL7 was established in 1987, the first version, and then later versions came out. Uh, HL7.2, I think, came out in 1989, I think. Uh, and then there's been evolutions of that ever since. Um, now, with FIRE, the, the evolution of that was going from that sort of standard messaging protocol that we're probably all used to in the old days, uh, and that includes things like EDI and that's, that sort of stuff as well, to much more an API-based and a REST-based interface. Now, I've mentioned 2019 there, the, the sort of um, start of all this was about five or six years before that, but you know, as, as an evolved standard, it kind of like bedded down in about 2019, and that's the, that is the logo, FIRE, FIRE. You know, they've not really tried very hard there. <clears throat> so what does it stand for? So I'm going, to, I'm going to call this out as something that I'm not particularly keen on. Fast healthcare interoperability resources. Why they didn't choose fast healthcare interoperable resources, I don't know, but that makes more sense to me. But, but anyway, so it stands for Fire Healthcare Interoperability Resources. And as you can imagine, that's essentially um, an ability to share information uh, in a standard format uh, that is meaningful to 
a bunch of different um, organizational applications in the healthcare space, whether that's GP applications or other things. And the idea really behind Fire is to provide a unified interface with a data store behind it. So if you've got a bunch of applications sitting around your, say you're a hospital, you've got a bunch of applications sitting around that may not talk Fire, if you have a standardized data store that has a standardized interface across the top of it, then you can push data in and people can drag data out in a format, in the fire format, and then just convert it into the format that they need for their application. So it creates that standardized access layer, essentially. Now it's, it's got another supported format, which is not a very well, uh, well recognized one, RDF, but uh, the two main ones, of course, are JSON and XML. Um, all the examples I'm gonna use are gonna be JSON. It's, it's, an API, it's a RESTful API after all. Uh, so all the ones I'm going to be using are JSON, but it does support XML in just the same way. There's this whole maturity model of Fire, right? So the current version is version five. So if you look there, this is just a snapshot of some of the things that have that some of the resources. Uh, it's not all of them. It's been clipped off at the bottom. You can see there. So if you look at the evolution of that, the numbers essentially mean the maturity level. So it goes from you know no maturity to zero from and then zero maturity, so not non-existent zero maturity through to one, two, three, four, five. And N means normative. In other words, at that point, it's become something that's not going to change. So you can see there that we're R4, R4, B, and R5. R5 is, is the latest and greatest that was released this year. There's usually about a release once a year, maybe twice a year, interstitially. Sometimes they go into a test release. That's what the stew means. Um, R5 is kind of an interim release uh, that's also partly normative, right? So, um, and you can see there that some of those things i mean if you look at say payment notice it's gone two 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 four so that's obviously evolving um, and if you look at practitioner three 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 five that's evolving uh, but uh, the, the key ones really are those normative ones stay normative right so that's that's the key aspect of that uh, but i'm going to talk about the azure fire service azure fire service is using r4 uh, and that's an important point to make when you're interfacing with other solutions that don't use r4 they may use R5, and there's a way of getting around that, and I'll talk about some of that a little bit later on. <clears throat> there's a very, very basic example. You have, not surprisingly, a bunch of objects, they're called resources, and those resources have hierarchical structures. Uh, so in this example, you've got a patient and a practitioner, uh, so that might be your GP, of course. They have an encounter. The patient asserts that they have a condition, which is a pain in their right ear, uh, and you know, they, they, they notice that they've got an elevated temperature. So, of course, the practitioner goes, OK, well, I'm going to observe that you've got an inflamed eardrum. I'm going to measure your temperature. So that temperature is 38. I'm going to say that, the, that you have otitis media. And so that's the condition. I'm going to prescribe a, uh, an antibiotic. So, so that's, that's the kind of the way it works. It's not just this. That's just a very basic example. Uh, there's a lot more to it than this. Uh, and I'm just going to quickly just jump out of here and uh, just show you the... Um, the oh, Showing my working there. Right, so here, this is the homepage, fire.org. But actually, if you click through any of this, it takes you to the HL7 website. And this is what you saw earlier on, right? That, that's that list of things that you, uh, that you saw earlier on. Foundation stuff here, of course, and various uh, compliance and, and so on. The interesting ones starts happening down here, level three. So we've got patient, practitioner, care team, and so on. Organization, location. We've got other things down here around, say, diagnostics. So there's observations. Uh, there's medications, you saw the medications, so that would be something like, um, you know, the amoxicillin, uh, appointments, and then there's encounters and appointment. Uh, appointment is kind of a form of an encounter. You can do claiming as well, some, some of this financial analysis. And if you think about organizations like the typical um, organizations that we get our healthcare from, uh, very often you'll go to, to have a consultation. The output of that will be a bunch of information. That information, which I'll come to in a little bit uh, more detail later on, has codes, those codes are standardized codes, those standardized codes match billing codes inside that organization and that allows them to bill you. So that's kind of the way that, that processing works, very, very basically. But I just wanted to walk into the, one of these examples here. So here's patient. Uh, you can see here that we're looking at R5, right? So that's what that's saying there, we're looking at R5. <clears throat> As we wander down here, you know, there's a lot of information. You can see the structure. So we've got R5 as a patient. Uh, there's an identifier, which has zero to many uh, settings. There's active, which is zero or one, and it's a Boolean, and so on. And you can see, and as you drill into these, gender, as an example, you can see gender is, there's the short display name. It's of type code rather than a, a string or something else. So that's basically a lookup. Uh, and, and you can wander through and, and build a view as to what all these things are. 
and uh, and so on. Right. If we go to R4 diff, bearing in mind that this is R5 and Azure Fire Service works with R4, then it gives you a brief uh, idea of what the differences are. And you can click through here and you can see these conversion maps. This uses the um, the, the standard language that, uh, that Fire used to define the differences between. But the nice thing about this is there's ways of actually transfers, transferring between these versions uh, directly with the Fire interface. So, and, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a little while. If we just go back here again and go to up here to compartments, you can see compartments. If this gives you an idea of what uh, resources can sit underneath uh, a, a patient object, essentially. So you can come down here, you've got patient, you've got encounters, related persons, the practitioner, and so on. And I can go into an encounter and I can do the same here. I can look at the level of um, information in here. Uh, and so you've got conditions and so on and so forth. Observations, of course, and that, those are the sort of things that we were looking at in another example, right? So, so uh, that's just a quick run through of that. Let me just get back to my slides. Uh, there we go. And take a quick drink. So the Azure Fire Service has kind of evolved. So it was just the Fire API, but they've now uh, brought three services together under the Azure Health Data Services banner. So Fire is that sort of information about you, your practitioner, your observations, your billing, and so on and so forth. That kind of information that would probably go on your medical record. Essentially, what sits behind the Fire service is a data store. You don't have access to that data store. You have to access it through the Fire service through a very, very standardized um, API. If you do need access to the Fire store, you can actually run, there's an open source uh, version of a Fire server, which is downloadable from Microsoft. You can run that uh, LVM and, and just have access to the data store and with a standardized Fire API on top of it. But yeah, if you don't need access to the data store, then you can just use the Fire service as it is. <clears throat> DICOM is for medical imaging. So uh, essentially that's you know things like MRIs, X-rays, and so on and so forth. And it's just, again, it's a standardized way of storing medical images and being able to link them to your uh, electronic medical record that's stored in Fire. And then med tech is more to do with that device side of things. So really that's around um, the internet of medical things, IOMT. So IOT with an M in it. <clears throat> so uh, whether that's a smartwatch, whether that's devices in the home, or so on and so forth, you know, bed, bed sensors, all manner of things could, could fit into that space. What I want to do is just spend a little bit of time just talking through three architectures that, that I think, uh, so Microsoft have published a bunch of reference architectures uh, on their architecture center that cover uh, healthcare scenarios. <clears throat> There's three that I just want to go through uh, relatively quickly before we uh, before we move on to some of the some of the actual sort of um, more important, I suppose, stuff around interacting with the fire service. <clears throat> so the first one is just general data integration, and you can see that I mean the numbers tell you what's going on here. So um, you know you've got some stuff on the outside. It's going through an application gateway. It's going into the health data services. You can see that down at the bottom there. Uh, there's a loader. So that loader is has an ability to push bulk data into uh, into the Azure health data services. Um, it's actually available to download. I'm going to talk about something that I want to do more broadly across the community in Australia uh, a, a bit later on. Uh, not surprisingly, there's a lot of stuff around analytics. So, you know, getting that data back out, putting it into Synapse and, and running a bunch of analytics across the top of it. Uh, the container registry is an, industry, is, is an interesting one. You heard me mention about converting from R5 to R4. <clears throat> out of the box, it actually supports uh, converting from HL7 version 2 into Fire version R4 as well, right? The, the Azure Fire service. <clears throat> so if you think about that, what that means, that means you can take your current HL7 messaging in infrastructure and relatively quickly onboard the Azure Fire service and do the conversion at the point of entry into the Fire service. The, the Azure Fire service supports uh, HL7 v2 to R4 already. If on the other hand, you have some arcane version of, of messaging and you want to convert it to R4, as an example, what you can do is you can create a liquid template and a script, store that in a, in a container, store that in a container registry, and essentially the Azure Fire Service can use that container registry at the point of use. So when you write that information in, it will use this, the liquid template to convert that data into Fire format to put it into Fire. So what that does, of course, is it extends the reach of Fire Service. Because remember, the whole point of the Fire Service is 
not putting out fires. The whole point of the fire, I thought I'd get the gag in again. Uh, the whole point of the fire service is to create a centralized resource of all your medical records and, and the information that pertains to your medical records. So you may have a GP service, you may have, you know, a back end billing service, you may have, you know, practitioners, the, the general, the GPs themselves may have, you know, finance services, they may have, um, you know, uh, onboarding. So there may be all manner of things that are feeding what could be medical record information. So what the fire service is doing is creating that centralized store with a unified interface for you to then get data into and out of uh, uh, that centralized store so that everybody can talk the same language without actually talking the same language to each other and having a whole schmozzle of, uh, of, uh, of stuff around um, around uh, conversions. So I quite like that one because it's, it's a very sort of enterprise-y level one. So you can see the two landing zones there, haven't spoke landing zones. That's very typical of, of uh, large-scale organizations. Uh, the next one I want to talk to is about AI a bit more specifically. So you can imagine here, so you this is, uh, you can see on the right hand side, we've got these personas. On the left hand side, we may have those clinical sense systems and sensors and finance and claims, of course, uh, ingestion sides of things, storage, and, and then you know, uh, reporting. But down the bottom, uh, it says machine learning. This is quite an old view of this. And you can imagine replacing that machine learning with, say, something like OpenAI, and then getting things like um, OpenAI uh, doing summarization of doctor's notes. or looking at a doctor's note where he says, uh, this person has type one diabetes uh, and I prescribed such and such insulin at this 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 dose. Uh, you can use something like the text analytics for health, which is able to extract those pieces of key information. This says diabetes, this says insulin, and then you can use other standardized um, medical uh, formats, SNOMED, ICD-10 and a few others to convert those into the, into the actual Codes, so SNOMED and ICD-10, just being two of those examples, which you may use in your backend system as billing, as billing formats, right? So, so you can very quickly see how you can use Gen AI in some of these things to generate information, including even things like, um, you know, uh, taking your your medical shorthand because because you can try this in ChatGPT. I have it understands medical shorthand. It is American medical shorthand that it understands. Unfortunately, uh, Australian medical shorthand is slightly different. But you can take medical shorthand and it will convert that into, into you know, natural speak. And then you can summarize that in a format that you know, could go to a, to a patient, as an example. So that, that's, that's a quite an interesting use case uh, as, as it stands in terms of generative AI. <clears throat> One of my favorite ones, of course, uh, is, is IoT. Again, anybody who knows me knows I'm a huge fan of IoT or IOMT, medical devices or medical things in this particular case. So you can imagine that here you may have a bunch of devices Maybe you've got um, a fall monitor uh, around the neck. Maybe you've got a, a, a bed pad so you know when somebody gets out of their bed. Maybe you've got water monitors. Maybe you've got um, electricity monitors. Maybe you've got room sensors uh, that are all supplying information uh, as to the behavior of somebody, say, in, who's in a, in a home setting. And that's all going through uh, into med tech, um, taking some of that information. Yeah, that, that's just general IoT data, but this would be things like heart rate. This would be things like have they taken their pills? This would be things like uh, the blood, uh, their, their blood pressure, that sort of thing, right? So maybe they're wearing a smartwatch. Going into the fire service and then doing a bunch of analytics and other things off of the back of that and making decisions. Maybe that's informing a loved one that something's up. Maybe that's sending out a care team. Could be all manner of things. So I think this is a really interesting use case uh, in terms of you know home care, uh, so that, which is one of my, uh, one of my passion areas. So those are three examples there. Let me just go through those again. You know, just general data integration, one more around the use of the use of AI, and another one around the use of medical uh, devices uh, and how they can impact uh, people going forwards. And the fire service essentially sits in the middle of all of those. <clears throat> I mean, obviously it doesn't have to, you could use SQL database or, or many other things, but the advantage of using the fire service is it gives you that lingua franca that everybody can convert in and out of uh, and gives you a centralized store for all of that data and information. So how do you use it? Well, that's the output. These are both outputs, right? And I'm, I've chosen to, choose to show you the outputs of the inserts and the upsert and the patch uh, because it's important. It's, it makes an important point. <clears throat> so I'll show you how to do an insert and an upsert uh, and the patch in a, in a little while. But out of the box, <clears throat> the fire service supports upserts. You can tell, you can say if it matches, then you know, obviously update. If it doesn't match, then then insert. Uh, what happens when you do an insert is you get this version and the last updated. 
Now that's very important because every time you do a patch, as you can see in the second example, that version ID gets updated. So I'm going to talk about cloud for healthcare being one example of a, a large scale business application that can can uh, can deal with fire, and, and that becomes a very important way of, of managing the 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 audit trail of, of changes of data, right? Because every time you do an update, you get a new version. Uh, and you can see there what you're doing. You get this, this is a resource type of patient. Uh, you get this huge great GUID. It doesn't have to be a GUID. You can make these up yourself. Uh, and then if there's a version and, and that last updated data to, to allow you to, well, it's almost like a change feed in, in a way, I guess. So that's reading and writing. So that's writing. Uh, and you can do deletions. So you know, deletions is just using the delete verb. Uh, but there's also a way of getting the results. Not surprisingly, if you're doing a lot of writes to a, to a medical, rec uh, medical record, you want to be able to get specific information out. Uh, these are just some examples. Um, you can see that there's a, there's four that say get and one that says post. The uh, the interface actually supports both post and get to, to retrieve information. Uh, you can imagine what these mostly are. So the first one is getting a patient back and just retrieving a couple of elements. Uh, the next one is bring me back all patients where birth date is missing. So there's a bunch of different um, uh, declarative things that you can put on thing uh, on this search uh, criteria. And I might just, if we have time, go through a few of those. Uh, just to show you what, what you can do. Not is another one. Uh, the next one's kind of like almost like a reverse lookup. So it's saying, okay, given this patient ID, give me all of the encounters that, that patient ID has has got. Uh, so that's so going from the patient ID and, and working back to the encounter. Um, the last one I'll go to just very quickly is from the post, and then I'll come back to the previous one, uh, which is obviously you can see there is 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 just doing a search and searching for the name John. The reason I wanted to come back to the uh, the fourth one is you'll see these codes, and that's very, very typical, again, of the way that healthcare systems work. So you don't just have gender. When you have certain things, there are certain organizations, in this case, LOINC, um, who maintain a list of very, very specific codes, which means a very, very specific thing. So what this is saying is, yeah, bring me back observations where, and I won't read it all out, you can see component code value, uh, and that 8462-4 and that 8480-8 mean something in the world in the world of LINK who, who maintain these codes. Um, I'll let you think about what that is, and I'll, I'll talk about it more when we get to the example, but it's saying 8462-4 greater than 90, or 8480-6 uh, greater than 140. So those two numbers may mean something to, to certainly some of us who are who are slightly older uh, in the um, in the people watching. So you, you've seen how you do lookups, you've seen how you do writes and updates. Deletions are just like I say, just a verb based on on the resource ID. So that's very very simple. But there are a bunch of other very key operations. I'm only going to talk about a few of them. A bunch of very very key operations that do very specific things. So you can probably guess what some of these are. They're not named <laughs> difficult in, in any way. Uh, so export exports data. So uh, you can export everything. You can export all patients. You can export just a patient. You can export different things based on, on search criteria. So that's what export does. When you want to do exports, it exports it to, um, to a, uh, a storage account. You can, by default, it's, it's not as secure as it can be, but there's... there's um, Lots and lots of information in, in Learn, Microsoft Learn, as to how you make that a very, very secure connection between Fire and, uh, and, and the document and storage. Import obviously does the opposite. You can import the bulk imports. Patient dash everything essentially brings back every piece of information to do with a very specific patient. There's, there's, there would be an ID invo involved in that as well. That dollar convert data is what I was talking about in terms of converting data, say from HL7 V2 to Fire or your own version. So if you have your own version, uh, you put a route into your, um, your your container registry, and it uses that in order to then transform your data <clears throat> and validate. You can imagine that most of these things have standard formats. What you can do is you can either use the standard, and they're called profiles. You can either use a standard profile that comes with a particular resource, say the patient resource, or you can create your own. So if you've got a specific need that says you always must have something in your data, and you need to be uh, a, a required field, you can create your own profile and use that profile to then validate your case. So it's just a great way of doing, uh, sort of uh, making sure that you've got some um, some data quality control. 
I'm just going to talk very briefly about Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare because it is a it's a big beast, and I'll just show you how big a beast it is. So that's Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare. They're all the various various driven uh, model driven apps that are part of uh, Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare. Uh, and the key thing here is there's there's a bunch of things that are fairly obvious. Uh, and a bunch of things that may be less obvious. But the main thing really here is you've got things like the care management and care team member. Uh, that's very much about how you deal with your patients, right? not surprisingly. Uh, the other interesting one I just want to pull out very quickly is the data integration toolkit. That's where you go into in order to set up the integration in and out of the fire service. And essentially what you need to do is you need to enable each individual object to say, I want these to go backwards and forwards to fire. The object has to exist in Fire before you can do anything. So you have to go shell out to a, um, a Logic app to create it first, bring back the ID, update the record in Cloud for Healthcare, and then from that point onwards, everything flows as normal. Your mileage may vary. There are some objects that don't flow quite so well, uh, but that's where you set all that sort of information up in, in the data integration toolkit. How does that work generally? Well, you know, I've, I've mentioned around the fact that, you know, you've got these various views, you know, the various apps, that goes against the Dataverse in Cloud, Cloud for Healthcare. There's an update, something goes into the Fire API uh, to update things, and then it, it feeds back information. So the, the kind of information that you need to send is the ID, the kind of information that comes back is that version that you saw, and that last updated date. So you need to make sure that, well, you don't need to make sure, it will update that information for you inside the Dataverse. And you can do your own processing if you need to. Like I say, that certainly for the in, in the in, from the creation perspective of a patient record, it doesn't create a patient record automatically. Uh, so you have to do it automatically through through using a a, 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 a logic app, and that's all published, right? Uh, so that's all good. Um, I just remembered I forgot to mention something, and I'll just go back very quickly so as I can mention it because I don't want to forget to mention it. The one thing I wanted to call out here, which I forgot to mention. Well, as you can see, it says Fire Analytics Pipelines and Fire Data Anonymization. Those are two open source projects that are supported by Microsoft um, to make sure that you can easily manage moving data from one place to another place, which is obviously what the Analytics Pipelines does in terms of ADF Pipelines. Uh, and, the and the last one there is about the data anonymization. You can imagine that a lot of the records inside Fire contain a lot of very, very sensitive information. So uh, what that Fire Data Anonymization process does is anonymizes all that data so it can't be traced back. I'm not sure how far down that goes. You can argue that uh, you, just by knowing a person's conditions, you could potentially know who they are. Uh, but but uh, there, there's certainly some things there that you can do. Right? So just, just my own memory failed me there. So uh, so apologies for the thing. Uh, right. So let's get into it. So I've got about. I want to leave maybe 15 minutes at the end just to to do a quick uh, wash up of any questions we might have. So I'm going to go back into here. Um, what does all this stuff look like? So Right, so, apologies, it's a quick drink. Right, so here we have our fire serve, our, um, our health data services workspace. You can deploy and these services directly from here, or you can just come down here and look at them. So I've created one already for each of these. I'm not using the DICOM and the MedTech service today, but if we go into the main one here, this is our fire service. You can see I've got a, 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 um, an endpoint. You can see it's using R4. Uh, and you can set this up to, to use various site identities, of course. Um, you do have to give the, uh, the system managed identity in the, um, in the fire service access to the, and the correct, app, the correct role in the storage account in order for export to work. Uh, but beyond that, generally speaking, you can access uh, this fire service through all tool, and I'll, I'll show you that, that very briefly uh, in the standard way that you would always do it with a, with a service uh, with an application registration. So it's all very simple stuff. Uh, I've also got and just to show that there's no smoke, smoke and mirrors going on. So if I go into the storage browser here and go into containers, I've got this fire export folder which doesn't contain anything. I will do an export, and hopefully it's an asynchronous process, so it can take a little while. Uh, hopefully that'll get done in the meantime. In fact, you know what? We'll do that first because that way at least it'll happen. So here I've got Postman. I've got a bunch of stuff already set up in here that I'm going to walk through. Um, and let me just make sure I've refreshed my token. Uh, any access token? All right, use that. Right, cool. So the metadata endpoint and the health check don't require um, the authentication, which uh, is, is by the by, but you can go in here, you can do the metadata, and what it will do is it will bring back all of the information to do with 
you know, the, the healthcare API, the versions and so on and so forth, what formats you're allowed to talk to it in. So, you know, uh, Fire plus JSON, if you're doing patches, which we'll talk about, they're the, they're the formats you can use. There's a bunch of stuff around where you get access tokens from. Uh, don't worry, those will be removed. Uh, so, and then what the various resources support. So this supports create, so account here supports create, read, uh, and so on, uh, and, and yeah, a, bu a bunch of other information. So it's it's all very useful because it also tells you the uh, the various search types that it supports as well. If you do health check, we'll just bring that back and we can see it's healthy, which is great. So it's successfully connected and the status is okay. So what I first wanted to do, uh, so what I did is I did a bulk load of 10. If you go onto the uh, the fire loader um, uh, open source project, you can see that there's a bunch of data that's like 10 records. So I've just loaded those. That's all I've done. I've, I've not done anything smart or anything like that. I've just loaded, loaded those 10 records so we can bring some information back. So here you can see I'm just calling patient on there and, and we'll see that if I run that, I get a bundle that's essentially, yeah, it's, it's, it's phrased for, for a batch of information. And we can come down here and we can see that there's, you know, I've got a patient, I've got an ID, there's that version and, and the last updated date. Um, and then there's a bunch of other information. So there's data here, um, OMB, so it's, it's non-Hispanic or Latino. And again, these are all those standardized um, views uh, or standardized um, uh, lookups and objects, right? So if we come down a bit further here, patient maiden name, obviously you can see this is anonymized data. Uh, where they're located, uh, what their medical record is. Uh, so this this one here is so their uh, it's got a medical record number, and that's the number, social security number, and again this is all that, uh, anonymized data, right? So uh, where they are and so on. Right? You can also do a count, right? So if I just look at that, essentially what I'm doing is summary equals count, and you can see that I've got ten records because that's what I added. Fantastic. <clears throat> and this is that patient everything. So if I go patient. There's, there's, a, there's an ID, everything, and I'm just going to bring back the observations uh, for that particular patient. If I run that, you can see it comes back, um, and there's an observation, and that observation is the LOINC code uh, with 7889, uh, which happens to be the red blood count, uh, and, it, and it has a value of, of such and such. Right? So you can see there that that's what's come back. So that LOINC code there is, is like I was showing before, the 8462. Uh, so that that particular link code, and it is, uh, ironically enough, it is pronounced link. Uh, their their um, their logo is a pig, and they just thought that was funny. So uh, and you can read you can read the blog post about how that how that evolved. Uh, but um, but essentially that's so seven eight nine dash eight is the red blood count. So that's that's what that means, and it has a standardized uh, unit of measure, um, as you can see here. <clears throat> do a patient search as well. So if I come in here and I go, okay, well, I want to look for every name that contains the word James. You can see that when I come back, I don't have anything. That's because I haven't added the record yet that, that I know I'm going to need to add it in order to get that one back, right? But I can do all manner of things in here. And if I just very quickly drop into here and just go to search, uh, it's, the documentation is really very good, right? So you have all these different concepts of different types of search, chained and, re chain and, re chained and reverse chained. Uh, and you can see that you go down here and it gives some examples of what are supported. Uh, but if you go down to the search examples here, there's actually a bunch more examples of, and it's a bit more detail. So include, so does it include a uh, medical medication request uh, for this particular patient, right? Um, reverse include elements, not missing. You saw me doing missing exact matches, contains, you saw me doing that. And then these chain searches, can you get a diagnostic report where the patient name is, starts with Sarah, right? Uh, and so on. So, so it's, it's, it's a very, very uh, feature-rich search process. Um, it's not always the easiest thing to use, particularly when you're starting to look for the more arcane things. So these things are pretty straightforward. But when you're doing things like looking for specific codes and, and you're looking for specific, um, so you saw that code value there, so that there is a link code for something specific, which is less than 9.2. Uh, right, so, so you, you need to know what those codes are in order to look them up. <clears throat> so let me go back to here. So that didn't bring anything back. But if I go to add, because that's the next example, uh, you can see that I've got a bunch of stuff here. So this is the, essentially I'm putting a patient in. There's his name, mail, um, I'm posting. Uh, so you have to tell it what it's doing. And it's doing this if none exists, right? So and if I just go down to the end here, 
um, that's a different example. Uh, but it's, so if uh, if so, it's, what this is basically saying, if you don't ex if it exists, use this ID. If it doesn't exist, then create a new one. Essentially, right? So so um, so I'm creating a new patient with some information, and they have that observation, which is that link code, uh, and and some more information, right? So if I send that, what I get back is a, an ID, and it's the first instance of it. So you know, there's version one, and there's there's the information that's come back. Is so this is this is the record that is created essentially, and that's all good. So if I now go back to search, and I search for James, we can see I've got one record back, right? And if I go back to count click that we can see that I've now got 11 right so I've added that record and that's great but what if I want to update it so so here's an update process and the update process uses patch and there's a couple of ways of doing patches you can either do that bundle process just sending a bunch of JSON uh, there's another process as well which uses JSON.patch but this one this particular process which I kind of understand a bit more so this is the reason why I've chosen to show this one uses a very specific content type fire plus JSON uh, and in here, and this is why it makes sense to me at least, I'm saying I want to create an operation. That operation is a replace. I'm going to the path, which is patient.gender. Uh, I'm going to change the value to female. And the reason this says value code is if you recall, when we looked at that uh, patient record inside the fire uh, definition, and we looked at gender, it said it was of type code. So if it said it was of type string, then I would change that to value string. If it was an ID, I'd change that to ID and so on. Boolean, it would change to value Boolean. So as a person who understands paths as an integration person and a person who understands you know, very, very simple declarative processing, this is basically saying to me very, very simply, I'm going to change patient.gender. I'm going to replace what is currently there with the code female. So that's why I like this fire plus JSON format. It just, just makes a lot of sense to me. And of course, you can have as many of these as you like. You can see it's an array. So if I click send on that, it says bad request. That's that's unfortunate, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, this this works about half an hour ago. What have I changed? Uh, so it's basically saying it doesn't like uh, patient gender. Oh, did not add the record properly. Um, let me just do that search again. Uh, or we go back to. So this this is why this is why you constantly check that everything works right. So uh, and uh, we all know that, right? So uh, let me just do the search. I came back with that ID. Oh, that's why I know why it's not working. It's because what I haven't done. You'll notice here that I was testing it earlier on, but then I deleted the record. <laughs> so. Let me change the ID because I was up, trying to update a, uh, a record that didn't exist. Now you can see it's come back as, as OK, right? And you can see that there's the last version is 2, or the version ID, ID rather is 2, and that's uh, the, um, the current time. And you can see that I've updated that to female. And if we did that search again, uh, just to bring that record back, uh, you would see down here, if everything's worked well, it's now changed to female. So that's all worked. Fantastic. Uh, if we do the observation search, I just wanted to show that. If uh, I wonder if anybody can figure out what this is doing, 8462-4. Uh, like I say, people of a certain age will probably understand that greater than 90 and greater than 140 are certain metrics. Uh, and I just want to go in here and go to this link code. And you can see that 8462 is your diastolic blood pressure. So essentially, greater than 90 is saying, or oh, and, and the other one is your systolic blood pressure. So saying greater than 90 or greater than 140, those are the two metrics that people use to define hypertension. And there's ICD codes. That's one of the codes that I was talking about. So this is the ICD code for hypertension, uh, and this is the SNOMED code for hypertension. So, so you can sometimes see these things knocking around in fire definitions as well. So that's what I just want to show there. <coughs> Deletes obviously works the same way as, as you'd expect. I'll have to change that to the correct ID. So let me just do that. And then when I delete, it runs and, and, and deletes it. Just before I do validate, I'm just going to kick off export because what you'll see is when that responds, it comes back as accepted because it's an asynchronous process. Right? So it's responded as async. Right? So when we go to validate, the thing I like about doing the validate is when I, I use some canned data in the fire loader. So when I click send here, you can see it's come back and there's errors. 
And one of the errors is that that particular record is incomplete, right? So <clears throat> but it's also saying that something is deprecated. So obviously the, the stuff that is in the, um, in the repository is not fully valid in terms of the, 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 the profile that's been set inside Fire. But that's okay, that's all groovy. Uh, it, that just happens to be to some trash data that they've created. The other thing is that the Fire interface actually supports GraphQL. Now, unfortunately, as we will see when I run this here, the requested route was not found, but it's not found because unfortunately the Azure Health Data Services Fire API doesn't support GraphQL. There is, however, an open source project that's maintained by Microsoft, which allows you to put a function app in front of your Azure Fire service, and that does then process Fire uh, GraphQL back to you. And of course, if you want to then expose that through a, a API management, which su supports GraphQL, then you can go ahead and, and go nuts and do that as well. If we just go back here to this resource group and check, so there you go, so it's created it. And what this is doing is this is uh, it's a, um, a very, very simple piece of JSON. It's MD JSON. So um, I think I've got an example of this already. Uh, let me just see what, uh, what I downloaded here. So there we are. Let's open that Visual Studio Code. There we go. And you can see that essentially it's a very, very simple, simple format, right? So it's patient with its ID and it's basically one row well, one record per row, right? So you can see that there's all that, all the information to do with that particular piece, uh, that particular customer, that particular group of people, right? So, so that's how that export process works. So that's taken us through a bunch of, you know, a, a fair number of various different things that support that the API supports. The next thing I want to do is go back to my slides because I want to talk about what I'm going to try and do. So I, I did a sort of a, a baby version of this presentation a couple of days ago in Perth. Uh, and I've been speaking to the people at Microsoft, and what they've created is essentially a, a, a health care hack. So you'll see a bunch of moving parts here, uh, you know, obviously ingestion on the left, uh, intelligence on the right. Uh, they've created a bunch of challenges around these, um, and essentially they're, 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 they're challenges, but they're also kind of um, uh, um, almost like hands-on labs, right? So, so my... My call to action to everybody is I am more than happy to, and I've, I've had a chat with the people at Microsoft and the healthcare team. Uh, my intention is to try and fly around, in Australia, uh, fly around Australia and actually run these hacks on real data, right? So real, real data sets. And you can see there's medical data coming in. There's, there's the, the, in the bit that, there, that says extract and load fire EHR data. So that's specific data. So that's going to be customers and actual data. Uh, so my, my plan is to try and create this in the new year as, as, a, as a consistent set of um, challenges and we can do a one-day hack in, in any city that wants to do it. So please reach out to me uh, on LinkedIn or, or, or through the usual channels and, and we'll see if we can hook that up. Um, with that, um, Bill, do we have any questions? Trying to find the uh, unmute, but um, no, there isn't, there isn't any questions out there yet. Okay, well, um, with that then, I shall just say thank you uh, for, for giving me, I, know I was aiming for 45 minutes, so that's pretty good, I was 43 minutes, uh, so that, thank you for, for your attendance, and, uh, and obviously uh, the video will be will be uploaded uh, for, your, uh, for your review at any time, um, and with that, I guess I'll hand back to you, Bill. Okay, um, <clears throat> any questions, guys? Um... Let me just uh, stop sharing. Let me mm -hmm. remove that one. I'll add that one back. And so thank you very much. Um, and I will now end the live stream. Thank you very much. Cheers, all.